first tandem. There we go. Our very first Tandem Talks webinar. For those of you that aren't familiar with Tandem Group, we're a nationwide recruitment partner with specialized experts in healthcare, technology, life sciences, and professional services. And that includes accounting and finance, financial services, legal, HR, and people, operations, and creative and marketing. Today's webinar is entitled Diverse Minds, the Impact of Inclusion in the Workplace. As many of you, I'm sure, know, DEI is and should be an extremely important initiative for all organizations, and we have a great discussion in store for you. After today's webinar, you will receive a survey that I would encourage everyone to please complete. Being this is our inaugural webinar, we will always strive to improve these sessions and to choose timely content with the intention of providing information and thought leadership to make positive impacts in your organizations. Now, I wanted to take a brief moment and introduce our expert panelists. First, we have Marlo Gall, the Chief People and Diversity Officer at On Course Home Solutions. We also have Kevin Chan Bradley, the Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community at Hub International. And leading the discussion today are Jen Barley, the CEO, and Karen Sullivan, the President of Kickstart Your Edge. And with that, Jen and Karen, I'll let you guys take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to this um, discussion that we're going to be having today. We are thrilled to be here. This is going to be a conversation and an interaction. So we have a lot of different activities planned, some uh, bits and pieces of information that we definitely want to share. And then we're uh, Karen and I are going to facilitate some questions and ideas and some solutions from our experts of Kevin and Marlo. So welcome everybody. Um, why don't we start off with Kevin, what else would you like to share about your background and why you're so impassioned about this topic? Well, um, on a professional level, I've been at this for a few years, um, probably a little over 20, 25. Uh, 11 years with McDonald's. I've been with the Boeing Corporation and other companies doing this work. So um, it's been a professional passion of mine. On a personal level, um, people see my name, they see my face, and they start scratching their heads. And some people actually start speaking Spanish to me. Um, but in actuality, I'm half Chinese. I uh, grew up in Chicago's Chinatown. So I've got um, kind of a personal stake in all of this as well. Nice. Excellent. Marlo, what about you? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see all of you here. Um, I, um, you know, professionally, I'll say it's part of my passion. I truly enjoy creating workplaces where people feel a sense of belonging and included and thrive. Um, it makes great business sense. I think the best of business decisions are made when you have diversity of perspective and that comes from your life experience. So professionally, it just makes sense. Personally, I'm the mom of twin boys who are 17, soon to be 18. And I would love for them to experience a world where there aren't as many obstacles as I had being a Black woman in cor corporate America. Um, on a high level, I have to say, doing this for a few decades now, I'm thrilled to see that you know DEI is not just you know, something we hang on the walls anymore. You know, the past three years, it's really about activating this work that we're all familiar with. So I think it's an exciting time all around. Excellent, good. And Karen, um, as my co-moderator and business partner, um, why don't you share a little bit about why you love helping to facilitate these types of conversations? And you're muted. One of the things that I feel like for me, being, you know, being a leader and, you know, going into organizations and helping organizations get from where they are to where they want to be, I think it's about challenging people. 
and challenging people to get out of their comfort zone and basically saying that, okay, great, this is the way this might look today. And tomorrow it's going to be completely different. And it's about being open-minded enough to look around and say, hey, you know what? What we might have done, like the the six most dangerous wor- words in a work environment. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, great, congratulations. You've been doing it wrong for 40 years. Now let's wake up. So I like to poke people a little, challenge their thinking and get them to wake up. I love it. So what Marla said is so true, right? So according to McKinsey, corporations that are identified as more diverse and inclusive are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. And um, and I know that we're all here to talk a little bit about diversity, DEIB programs, et cetera. So what we wanna do is get a lay of the land for from the participants in the chat, I am going to put a link. That link is going, if you click on it, it will launch open um, a web page for you to be able to answer a question for us so that we can understand um, exactly who's in the room and where are you with your DEIB initiatives. So the other thing you can do, I just did a share screen. You could just type in minty.com, use the code to enter. Both of those work. But right now, we want to know where is your organization in terms of DEIB? Have uh, the choices are haven't started yet, beginning stages, you're making great strides, and fully integrated. So let's just take a moment. And if for some reason the technology is not working for you, you can just throw your the uh, what your answer is in chat. Either way works. We're just informally trying to get a read of people coming to this conversation and and where they are. Right now, we're at about 16 of the, we actually have a nice turnout of 78 participants. And we have 18 people are making great strides, 10 people beginning stages, uh, two people are just starting out. One is in the TADA, fully integrated, which is great. And, and also, Jen, I just want to throw out here, the, these polls are anonymous. So if you're sitting there going, oh my gosh, we haven't started yet and you don't really want to click that number, don't worry, we won't know. Yes, that very fair point, very fair point. All right, this is wonderful. So then um, this is great. Okay, good. So this is giving us a good sense. The majority of people are in beginning stages and making great strides. And we have um, some people that are feeling great about their efforts and some that are very curious about perhaps how to even get going. We can definitely cover the spectrum here. And um, thank you all for participating in that. And let me go ahead and flip through. So one of the things that we talk about when it comes to diversity is realizing that there are many different factors that create people the way that they think, their own cognitive diversity, their own ways they show up in the world, the worldview that they have. And we just wanted to, I'll do a quick overview of this to see what the influences are. Then we'll have Kevin and Marla uh, make a few comments about this. But basically, as you look in the middle, every individual has their own beliefs, perspectives, and worldviews. Those beliefs, perspective, and worldviews are shaped from uh, internal um, situations that we're primarily born with, external, which are the influences that we have in life, as well as even from an organizational standpoint. So when we look at the internal ring, it is really about most of the times the things that we're born with, right? So our race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, we have our age as we progress through life. Um, Physical ability can change, right? So those are things, though, that are primarily fairly set. Um, And then the second ring with the blue for the external tend to be more about how we are influenced in terms of our political beliefs, the different experiences that we have, um, the religion that we maybe grew up with or not religion that we grew up with, family status. Somebody who's from a family of 10 siblings is going to have a different view on things than somebody who was an only child. And then from an organizational perspective, 
there are different ways that show diversity through, it could be a job level, it could be a management status, if you're in a union or non-union environment, those types of things. So before we uh, have Kevin and Marlo speak uh, some of their thoughts on this, um, I would like for you to, in chat, identify what word do you see on this slide that you feel has really shaped the way you view the world? What is it? And it can be anything from any of the rings. Just type in the one word that you say, this is really created who I am and the way I view things. So you can just type that into chat and then I will pass it over to Kevin. Uh, what are some thoughts? I can't hear. So we have some things that are coming in here, education, experiences, a lot of experiences, right? Nationality, physical ability, race, family, experiences, age, work location, race. Now there's no right or wrong. It's just gonna be everybody's individual viewpoint here, a lot of family. And it's true, we, we get handed down a lot of beliefs and how we show up in the world with that. Sexual orientation, excellent. All right, Kevin, you're up. Yeah, so um, what's interesting, I've seen different variations of the diversity wheel um, over the years. And, and um, you know, what, what's always been interesting is I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in, in simplicity. And one of my early mentors, um, he used to see a lot of companies getting hung up over the D word, you know, over diversity, and we're, we're still seeing it today. And, and he pulled me aside one day and he said, you know, at the end of the day, diversity is about counting heads. Inclusion is about making those heads count. Mm -hmm. And we really should be concentrating on the inclusion part because a lot of companies make the mistake of bringing in diverse candidates, diverse employees into environments that are not inclusive and, and maybe even toxic. And then they wonder why, why do we have a revolving door? So I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, again, just my opinion that um, while attracting and retaining a diverse workforce is important, I think, uh, how we treat those people when we bring them in is equally, if not more important. That's no great. Matter where they, no matter where they are on this wheel. Exactly, right? So I love that it's not about counting heads, but making those heads count. That's great. Marla, what's coming up for you? Yeah, I always find these um, exercises interesting. You know, when you talk about what influences you, I tend to believe. Uh, people who are typically in more likely than not in an underrepresented category, the factors that sort of shape your worldview are the obvious, like race and gender. If you're in an underrepresented group, and I think if you're in one of the majority categories, um, you know, race and gender may not as be as prevalent. And that's where you see some of the other factors um, that are further away from the center and sort of influencing your, your worldview. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's critically important for people to move away from this concept of, you know, only focusing on the numbers, right? I mean, diversity is the mix. Inclusion is about making that mix work. And I think now, even further, particularly after all of us coming out of this wave of, of, of COVID, because that's another dimension. Um, it's really affected, you know, mental health and well-being, um, a sense of belonging. You know, I know personally I've, you know, had seats at the table. So I've been included. I didn't necessarily feel as though I belonged. So I think another call to action for organizations is to, you know, push beyond just the concept of inclusion, but what do you do to create a sense of belonging? Okay. 
I love that. And what, um, what have you seen so far, Marlo, that has done that, really created that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's all situational, right? Um, I think one broad um, approach has been just the focus on um, mental awareness or, or mental health awareness and the impact that COVID has had on that dynamic in the workplace. I see a tremendous uptick in um, you know, more flexibility around time off, even, you know, policies and regulations that now factor in, um, you know, protecting mental health um, as creating a sense of belonging, because it's a dynamic that you don't, you no longer have to sort of minimize or shy away from or be embarrassed about. There's less stigma around that these days. So I think that's, you know, one example I've seen of intentionally creating more um, belonging in the workplace. Great. Good. Good, good, good. One other thing that we thought would be important to be able to share is to show the waterline of visibility. And this was kind of mentioned and, and um, but shown in a different way. There are certain things that we can see diversity. And then there's um, ways that we are diverse that add to diversity that are unseen. And um, I think this is important to be able to recognize because there's so much in that's under the waterline that truly needs to be included in organizations and taken into account. So um, Kevin, let me ask you, um, what is it that you feel that organizations are not focusing on that they really should be focusing on? Well, again, I, I'll go back to the earlier statement. Um, I think, and, and to Marlo's point, we really should be putting a lot of emphasis on inclusion and belonging. Um, you know, it's one thing, as, as Marlo said, to have that seat at the table, but if you're never uh, served the potatoes and they keep passing you by, you know, do you really belong <laughs> at that table? So, um, you know, I, th I think companies to some extent are doing okay in terms of seeing what's above the waterline and, you know, let's, let's have a, a nice family picture. Um, but again, those things that are below the waterline that really, you know, shape us um, are often, oftentimes ignored. So again, I, I can't stress enough as Marlo pointed out that sense of belonging. If you don't, you know, and I, I will tell you, if you look at the next generation of employees, um, if they don't feel that they belong, they'll leave. Mm -hmm. hey, um, go ahead, Karen. Hey, you know, Kevin, I, I, I love that you just said that because I was just sitting here jotting down some notes and thoughts and ideas. And I love that you just brought up the generation thing. And how true do you think it is? And this is, this is just me, thoughts are spinning right now. I feel like that it it really takes you know high quality um, DEI practice to get diverse candidates in the door, and I feel like that that there's a lot of the generation now that's getting people in the door. And my question is: is how much do you feel like the leadership is going to be? How how much do you think the leader influences? keep giving them in the door. So I know that that was a really long way to say, I feel like the younger generations are bringing people in, but what's the the people at the top, the leaderships, the, the people that have been there longer or have more tenure and experience? Um, how do you think that plays in? Um, I don't know if it's DEI initiatives that are going to drive the next generation to the workplace. I think it's really reputation and the reputation of your culture. You know, people are going to social media, they're going to Glassdoor. Um, you know, if you're if you're viewed as a non-inclusive organization, you know, the almighty paycheck doesn't always do it anymore, right? You know, so um, I think that that reputation as um, a pretty solid um, 
you know, contributor, uh, you know, to the societal good. I think, you know, a, a company that has a, a good reputation of you know, under, being understanding and inclusive. And I'll just, you know, end with this. Um, we recently, our military and veteran, our military veterans group um, had a former colleague of mine uh, do a webinar and he was asked, he's a Medal of Honor recipient and was asked, what are the, what are the two, what are the qualities of a good leader in your mind? And everyone expected this very militaristic answer and very technical answer. And he said, two things, in my opinion, make a great leader, empathy and love. No one expected to hear that from him. Oh, I bet. Yep, I bet. What do you think, Marla? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, um, you know, the, the whole generation factor, I think, is is important because, you know, this is the first time that we're seeing five generations in the workplace at the same time. I, I tend to shy away from sort of an all or nothing, like young people behave this way or think this way, but I'm certainly not naive enough to, um, you know, ignore, you know, we, younger generations now definitely so how you present in the workplace, if it doesn't show up into like the actual existence of your culture, you don't have to worry about retaining them. You won't even attract them. They won't be interested, right? So I think it really depends on, you know, I appreciate when employees or employers are just honest about who they are, right? Just be aware that if you're saying you are diverse and you prioritize inclusion and belonging is who you are, Tools now like Glassdoor and Blind and other mechanisms will either affirm that or call foul. So, um, you know, for me, it's a question of integrity. And once you agree on who you're going to be, everything you do at every stage of the employment life cycle, cycle has to align to that. And then you don't have to worry so much about, you know, which generations are being impacted because you're being consistent across the board. You know, inclusion and belonging is a way of life. So if you lead with those things, inherently, you'll be hitting all those intersectionalities naturally. I know you make me think, Marlo, about the, as you said, the whole life cycle of an employee, right? So mm -hmm. that starts from the reputation of, I'm thinking about applying for a position with this organization. What do I see? What do I hear? What's their reputation? to actually the interviewing process, to onboarding, to the day-to-day, -to, -day, to meetings, to all of that. And then even through the whole exiting of an organization as well. And it's really a top to bottom. I know when we were talking before, um, you have an aversion to this all be, be called programs, right? So DEI <laughs> programs, it's not a program. It's a, it's a way of integration into the culture. And so um, it is something for everybody on this call to be thinking about as you're, you're um, working towards all of this is how are you from the whole entire life cycle for an employee? Yeah, I mean, just double clicking on the whole concept of a program. I mean, we all know we've, we've rolled out programs and initiatives and what determines whether or not they come to life is money. Are they in the budget or not, right? So if you approach DEI through that lens, it'll always be an option. You can bolt it on this year because it's cool and sexy and fun. And by the way, people notice that and they think you're fraudulent. Or you can insist that this is just who we are. It's not the flavor of the month. You know, we're going to embed this in our three-year, five-year, seven-year plans until it just becomes fully embedded in the culture. You know, and I think you have to have an environment of, you know, radical courage, you know, call each other out when it's not happening. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes I've been in, in the room and it's a very homogenous group of women. And oftentimes I like to say, well, I don't like to say it because I don't like it when it happens, but I'll say I'm the only fly in the buttermilk, right? So the only woman of color in a very homogenous group of women. Is that diversity? Not really, not for me, right? So 
creating spaces where we can have the psychological safety and being honest about what is diversity really. Yeah. That's great. Kevin, anything to add? Uh, no, I think Marlo really hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And I oh, like potatoes too, Kevin, by the way. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm stuck on the potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to tell you guys, this is, this is interesting. I was just reading um, a report and it was the Global Leadership Forecast Series. And it was about their 2023 report that came out. And it's funny, I, I was thinking of both of you and, and after our conversation a couple of weeks ago, the big thing throughout this report was about, you know, quality DEI programs deliver results. And all I'm saying is, wait a minute, guys, this is not a program. This is not a program. Like this is the way that things need to be now. It's not just checking off a box. It's not a program. And I thought that it was fascinating that this 2023 diversity report that came out was talking about programs. Well, I, I kind of I kind of look at it this way. When I'm at the when I'm at the business table, um, is my marketing counterpart is what he or she doing a program? Is what the CFO doing a program? Is what the chief sales officer doing a program? If not, then what I'm doing is not a program either. That's great. All right. So here's what I think uh, we're going to do now. I'm getting a, a couple of things ready. I'm multitasking here, I have to admit. So let me just make sure I'm good to go. I just need to move Marla. What we're going to do is we're going to put you into breakout rooms and there'll be large breakout rooms. So if you're like, oh my God, a breakout room, don't worry. There'll be enough people in there that you can listen. <laughs> and if you also want to contribute, that works out at, well as well. But we're going to have you have a conversation and I'm changing the question I was originally going to ask. And I want you just to say, what are some of the challenges that you have found of creating a culture of inclusion and belonging? What are some of the challenges you have found around creating a culture of inclusion and belonging? And just have a discussion. And if you could walk away from uh, the breakout part with three to five challenges identified, that would be excellent. Um, because then those are ways that we can bring those into the conversation to talk about solutions or opportunities or perspective shift, et cetera. So, hey John, yeah. Um, can we consider a sub question to that? Because uh, I'm, I'm just extremely curious. Um, how many clicks away is your DEI leader from the C-suite? Ah, uh, okay. That's a good one. All right. So you guys heard it. It's two-parter, right? So the one is challenges of creating a culture of inclusion and belonging. And how many levels away, clicks away, is the DEI leader in your organization from this um, top level, the C-suite? And, um, and if you don't have one, that would also be good to know too. Okay, so I just am still looking. I need to make sure that Marla is not going to disappear into a room. If you are Marla, Marla, just hit um, leave room and then you'll come back here. So okay. that will work out fine. And we're going to give you uh, some time to talk on this. Um, okay, perfect. So uh, we're just going to give you, though, um, there'll be plenty of, we're going to give you about seven minutes to talk about this and then we're going to come back and we're going to hear what the room has to say and answer some questions. Here we go. It should push you right into the room. Yeah. All right, people are going to be coming back from their breakout sessions in just a moment. And we'll see what they have going on. Oh, I guess it'll be about 13 seconds. Excellent. All right. 
Good. We, I always love to hear conversations mid sentence when we come back into the main room. It tells us that that the conversations were happening. Thanks for playing along. I know sometimes it's like, who am I going to get matched with? How's this going to go? I hope we have things to talk about. It's such a good topic, though. So what we want to do is um, how about who would be willing to share what came up in your group? So there is two parts of it are the challenges of creating a culture of inclusion and belonging. Second part is how many clicks away from the C-suite is the DEI leader within your organization. And um, if somebody would be willing to just um, unmute yourself and share, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, I'll go for group one. All right, is this Great. Thanks, Eva. Yes, Great. so our group, what was nice was that we had people that were one step below the C-suite. Um, I mean, it sounds nice, but they were also a team of one. <laughs> like. <laughs> so, um, in addition, when the challenges are really, you know, the buy-in from the senior leaders, um, if your senior leaders aren't bought in, then how are we going to hold other people accountable? If people aren't taking training, if they're not, you know, hiring from diverse backgrounds. And for those of us that are global, it's harder to track that, right? Because only like in North America, my organization can only track in North America. We can't track elsewhere. Um, so it's really difficult when you don't have that buy-in to get people to get on board so you can truly be, uh, you know, a diverse organization, include people and give them that sense of belonging. Yeah. I think, I think that's something, why don't we, why don't we broach that, um, that right now? So Kevin and Marlo, what are, what do you, what are your suggestions on how to get the buy-in needed from senior leadership? Um, how do you go about it? And what does that truly look like in an organization that does it well? Um, I'll kick it off. Um, you know, I, I would say start with yourself first and foremost. I think there's major frustration in um, trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And if you don't have your value proposition in order, right? It's, it's, it's hard to figure out what position you play. So I think, you know, first and foremost, to start, start by assessing sort of your own barometer and why is this important to you and what your expectations are and keeping your, your um, finger on the pulse, if you will, so you can be used as a vehicle for change based on not only what you believe, but what you see and hear. And, um, you know, asking the question, you know, do you have, you know, are you giving permission to be held accountable, right? And then putting yourself in a position to do that, right? clear on what are our goals, what are our objectives, and more importantly, asking why. Why is this important to our organization? And then being that vehicle for change and coming up with solutions, right, and tactics to deliver on those commitments. Because, you know, I think we've all seen, you don't need a white paper to, you know, look at the numbers, right? Oftentimes you have a lot of diversity down here and the further up you go, it seems to dissipate. You don't need any a calculator for that one. So <laughs> I think, you know, don't be Captain Obvious, um, but come, come through, don't admire the problem, but come through with like tactics and approaches that makes sense for your environment. And it makes sense because you're in the middle of it, right? You can speak on the behalf of what's being said and done in the organization um, in a very unique position by being in you know, either HR or DEI directly. So use it to your advantage. And I think I'll just close with being honest. Like if this is important to you and this is your expectation, it contributes to your well-being in the workplace, and it's not happening, you always have the choice to change the room. You know, I've left organizations where people said, this is a priority to us, this is a commitment, and it just wasn't happening. And everything I've encouraged you to do, I did myself, and there was still no change. So I changed. That's easy to do too. Mm -hmm. Kevin? And, and Ivana, I'll jump on the, the global question. I've worked, I've had the the opportunity to work for a couple of huge global companies. And 
one of the things we did was we we didn't we didn't talk global, we talked global. So we had a global overarching uh, DEI strategy, but how it was executed and defined really had to be local, you know. And we would joke and and say that, you know, how you define diversity in Stockholm uh, can be very different than how you define diversity in Saskatchewan, right? So again, you know, what are the issues? Um, how, how is it defined locally and, and what kind of impact? Uh, and it was interesting, the first year we started talking about DEI and a global perspective, people would inevitably say, oh, that diversity stuff, that's, that's you all in the US, we don't have issues. Year two, we go to a conference, um, an in-house conference, and we have managers from Ireland saying, "Hey, I've I've got um, I've got Catholic kids and and Protestant kids working in the same restaurant. How do I make sure that you know we're all you know kind of getting along and working together for the common good? Um, you know, speaking to French managers, hey, we've got this immigration uh, issue that we're dealing with, and and you know it was kind of interesting once once we started using the language of inclusion." Um, and not leading with diversity, they were like, oh, okay, now I get it. But again, it was a very global approach. That's great, good. Yeah, I think some of that applies even like within the US, the lens of underrepresentation, right? So where don't we have sort of a, a mix of perspective experience, you know, you sort of pick and focus to diversity just for the sake of diversity because you could find that you're actually over indexing in some capacities if you're not careful so i local concept and i think you know you can be creative and even apply it within the u.s too mm -hmm. well it makes me think that yes if everybody on this call was to think about your organization and where are pockets that you can quickly identify need to have um, more, more viewpoints brought to the table to be able to have a better sense of in inclusion. Um, cause you could probably see in, um, you know, I think of all the, all the time about leading yourself, leading others and leading the business. And what Marlo said at the beginning was really about how do you lead yourself? How do you understand your own viewpoint? And, um, what your value proposition is and why it's important to you and how do you become that vehicle? And then the other is about leading others and influencing the teams that you're on and being able to um, have conversations. And then uh, also how does that impact the business itself in terms of ideas, um, invention, um, new ways of approaching the market space, whatever it is that's needed how can that even be augmented? So love it. All right, let's hear from another group. Thank you, group number one. How about, let's let's talk uh, to A. Edwards, Christina, Matt, and Zachary. You are in group number two. Would somebody be willing to share something that came up within your talk? Yeah, hello. Um, so we talked about how uh, the Shelley um, our D and I uh, leader here in the C-suite, so we have seen a lot of direct impact from that, and I think it's been amazing. Uh, I only joined the organization a year and a half ago, and I feel so much more comfortable in this company compared to my past. Um, and just I find that aware, we're very big on awareness here, and very a lot of information is shared, and it just already made me feel more comfortable and more. I know, uh, Marla, you mentioned sometimes yeah, it's hard to speak out, um, but you kind of feel more comfortable when people are more knowledgeable to speak out of, about when you feel uncomfortable. So um, I definitely um, mentioned that. And I know some people in my group did join late. So I I was, I think, the only one that heard at the beginning of the, the seminar. So. Um, I, I was late. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> no, Ari, um, Angela Edwards also was, uh, she was late as well. So, yeah. 
All right. So Zachary, let me ask you this. So you said that there's been a lot of awareness and information shared. What types of information is shared in your organization? Um, we have a lot of events uh, just uh, surrounding culture, surrounding different subgroups that are you know, not as well represented um, and underrepresented usually. Um, like when I answered on the wheel, I said sexual sexual orientation, and Marlo mentioned a lot of those under, unrepresented groups are in that internal wheel, um, I, of, as my understanding. And um, I lost where I was going with this, <laughs> but yeah, um, I've definitely felt that the awareness of just everything that is represented within the employees in our at our organization have groups we have ERGs and they focus on specific just things that are important to the employees at this company and that makes feel people welcome that makes people feel aware and the whole company is invited to all these events so I think it really opens up that comfortability. Hey Zachary yeah. um, aspirationally I'm going to say to you think about um, someone called it the AAA, right? You want to move from awareness to action to yes. accountability. So yeah. you're at the first day. Get, get um, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, the, the initiatives have been great. Uh, the Shelly took over them. I'm not exactly sure because I only just joined recently, but I have, you're right, it's, it's the start of something really great, though. So Kevin, I'm going to kick that one back to you, right? So I love that. The triple A, you have awareness, action, and accountability. Give us, um, and it may seem that as Marlo likes to say, Captain Obvious on it, right? But why don't you give us an example that moves from action, from non nothing to awareness, to action, to accountability? Okay, I'll, I'll do an easy one. So I'm at, I'm at a company that hires a lot, that hired, uh, one of my previous employers hired a lot of engineers. And engineering manager says, oh, woe is me. I cannot find a single woman engineer that can do these, this job. Um, so we make them aware that there are women engineers out there. Um, the action was we got sponsorship dollars to show up big time at Society of Women Engineers Conference, drag this manager along as part of our, our contingent, 5,000 women engineers under one roof. <laughs> That's the action. Um, and um, the accountability was our CEO sent us to that conference and said, you will come back, at, you know, and we hired a lot of interns. He said, you will come back with 100 interns. We yeah. came back with 86, but. <laughs> That's such a great example, right? And it's so interesting because people will say, I can't find women engineers. Right. And so usually what happens, and we've had this discussion before, is we turn to all the people we know <laughs> and say who tend to be like us at times. It depends on um, uh, of, of who you are and how you reach out of your own comfort zone of familiarity to be able to say, who else in my circle can I talk to to get a different perspective? And if your circle is the same, it's hard sometimes to get a different perspective. Yeah, Bob the engineer goes to Fred the engineer and says, I can't find a woman engineer. <laughs> right. Shocker. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and if we really even think about that, that's just even so much about the cognitive diversity piece of this. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to surround ourselves with people we identify with, right? And again, appearance, beliefs, perspectives, and it's kind of like a subconscious habit. And it, and it happens because we, it, it almost validates our own ideas because it's like, oh yeah, great. You said this, you said this makes us feel smarter. Right? And it really, basically what it does, it inhibits the successes of organizations. And it really, it, it creates this thing called collective blindness. And it doesn't matter how many smart people we have, if they all think the same way, they're not going to be aware of what they don't see because it's, it's not a failure on any one of these people's parts. It's just because they don't know, right? Things are called blind spots because they're blind spots. 
So you have no idea. All right. So awareness, action, and accountability. I am going to plant the seed that we are going to ask everyone on the call to think about an action you will take from the awareness of this webinar. So that will come <laughs> towards the end. And let's move on over to Aaron, Danielle, Julie, M. Cook, um, Simran, and Stephanie. Who would like to share a couple thoughts that came up in your larger group? I can share, Jen. I was the nominated spokesperson. Great, Julie, you're up. <laughs> um, so what we discussed in terms of some challenges for creating um, an inclusive culture, one of the things that we said, it, sometimes it can kind of just come down to location. We felt like, especially internally with Tandem, because we are growing so fast, we, we don't know everyone all the time. So there are people that are probably really interested in being involved in this, but it's just simply a matter of getting everyone together. Um, and I think also a second point to that is sometimes like we're all kind of naturally competitive with each other just based on the type of work that we do. Um, so as much as I think we have a really good culture here of wanting to see your peers win, I think there's a part of that that can um, also contribute to a challenge. Right, because if, it's, if it feels you know, internally competitive, Inclusion isn't usually the go-to. Right. Yeah. All right. So Marlo, have you ever seen organizations or have thoughts on how to blend? We'll just say when, when things are culturally, people are independent and maybe in a sales organization, there's a nature of competitiveness um, for the good of all. But yet that doesn't provide inclusion. What are your thoughts on how to bridge that gap? Again, I think you just need to be clear about the priorities, right? And if there are behaviors you're wanting to inspire and motivate, then reward those behaviors, right? So the people who demonstrate the behaviors you're aspiring to promote, celebrate that. And for those folks who are competing, their barometer will switch to like, oh, that gets the accolades or or whatever, whatever the reward is, right? Um, so I think you incentivize the behaviors you want based on your culture. And I think um, you also, again, just have to be very clear on what the expectation is. You know, I'll use my own um, organization as an example, you know, when I, when I joined, I mean, if you, you can go look us, we now have a name, so you can actually find us on Course Home Solutions. And the, the ELT is a pretty homogenous group besides myself and someone else. And part of the conversation I had with the CEO, because we've, we've had a couple of rodeos in prior lives, I said, look, if you're serious about this, the next opportunity you have in your ELT has to be diverse. And I mean diverse by way of being underrepresented. So he said, deal, I trust his word. He went a step further and put in all of our goals. We all have a shared goal that in this organization collectively, we'll need to hire, I believe it's four, um, diverse slash underrepresented professionals, you know, in feeder groups to get to that point where we have not only representation at the top, but also a pipeline of talent to populate the ELT level. Yeah. So um, I think you just, and it's, I mean, it's a goal, like your financial rewards are based on this goal. And there's also a hook on it for retention. So we're not just, you know, checking the box and we get a leaky bucket to Kevin's point. It's not an inclusive environment that inspires belonging. So you get the numbers on the front end, but then you see the uptick on people leaving on the back end. So there's also our retention component as well. Yeah. And, you know, either we win together in this collective goal or we all get 20% dinged on our bonus. You know, it's, it's interesting that you just said that because it makes me think of, you know, how do you incorporate um, DEI into succession planning, right? And how do you pre proactively recruit the high potential talent from the diverse backgrounds. So mm -hmm. you build that strong leadership pipeline 
it's gonna it's gonna take people that are gonna think more broadly. It's gonna take people that are gonna basically say, okay, great. What are the different skill sets? What are the different mindsets? What are the different different perspectives that we really truly need to to fill this high potential pool? But yeah, one hundred percent. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marlo. No, no. I was just thinking of an example. You know, it's it's a, you actually touched on it too with, with the the women in tech reference. I was in asset management. And it's true, you often don't find a lot of women in asset management and people of color um, as well. And when I was, you know, working with the team to find portfolio managers, um, I was told like, you'll never find a, you know, a black portfolio manager, you know, you know, doesn't exist. And I just, I'm a firm, black people are everywhere. We're, we're everywhere and quite talented. So, you know, my response was always, you're fishing in the wrong pools. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was like, a dog I'm going to find a rock star you know for this role and sure enough I did and the beauty not only is he brilliant um he's also a veteran right so again I found the right partner who specializes in asset management recruitment because I did not have an asset management background at the time and we had a mutual agreement we were in alignment on our values and what we were looking for we found him in New Mexico of all places. <laughs> but again, you have to get out of your day to day. If I look around and my circle of 10 looks just like me, I have to go to a di different circle. And as far as business diversity and an expectation of the people you're working with. Yeah, and Karen, the only thing I was going to add is you have to be careful with the succession plan thing because you will have people that will play, try to play the system. Um, we have folks that that loaded up their succession plan and had underrepresented folks marked as ready now. Five years later, they're still ready now and not getting moved. So we we examined and audited that as well. If someone was ready now for X number of years and had not been promoted. We had some conversations around that because, again, it looked like, you know, that folks were trying to play the system. The other thing, and I'm certainly not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice, but our our general counsel uh, did tell our CEO that he was uncomfortable with the word goals, um, but he was okay with the word aspirational goals. <laughs> this is play on words, right? That's why they went to law school, I guess. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I'm thinking back to what Julie had also shared about. So if you're in an environment for whatever reason, um, it has a more of a competitive nature to it. Wouldn't it be interesting? Like, this is just sort of me playing around with it, but wouldn't it be interesting to say, how can we still be con competitive and inclusive? So what that means is like, um, how do we come together and get the best of the best ideas from everybody's experiences of what they bring to the table? So it raises all of our game up a level. So it has to be a switch to, um, you know, all of us together will make us individually stronger, which usually it's individually, we make us all stronger, but there's something to be said that as you're trying to um, have inclusion is through just even idea generation and how do we approach this and what's something that's worked for you and how do we build upon that idea and then how do we individually go execute in that particular role in that particular situation it's an interesting way to say how can we have these conversations knowing that um, we have individual aspirational goals, individual goals that we have. And, um, but yet we have so many great different perspectives here that aren't being included. I think that could be an interesting exercise. Yeah. Okay. So let's pop on over to Amanda and Denise and Elizabeth and Lauren and, and a Staggard and a DeMaio. Uh, what came up in your group? I can add a couple of things for our group. Um, I think one that came up was um, just creating 
a culture of openness where you can talk about some of these things. Um, so if you if you need to talk about mental health with your supervisor, there's a culture there to to do that where you can have an open conversation and get what you need. Um, another thing that came up was um, location. Our company is like historically Northeast based in New York City, a lot of our employees are like born and raised tri-state area. Um, And that was always kind of interesting to me. Um, And then we also got, went from that onto a conversation about referrals. So if you're, you know, if you're really heavy on like employee referrals um, internally, does that create like a more homogenous group are you getting enough outside perspective oh great topics all right what i like that last one referral employee referral programs effective not effective is it more of the same is there enough diversity that comes through that what do you think kevin well you know i think employee referral programs are great but you know your talent acquisition team should have its finger on the pulse of your overall demographics. They should know if you're underrepresented. Um, If you're a federal contractor, it's even easier because there are formulas out there that'll tell you if, you know, if if you have adverse impact in, you know, in your transactions. Um, If you're not a federal contractor, those formulas aren't bad. Um, You know, so you look at applicants, you look at your applicants, you look at your availability. um, And again, it's a neat algorithm that's how you, if you have disparate impact, not a bad, exercise to go through. So again, I'm not a, I'm not averse to uh, employee referrals, but Marlo, Marlo used the term that I have used for a long time. You need to fish in more than one pond. You know, if, it, if you're fishing in one pond and, and, and getting one kind of fish, you can't complain that you're not getting other kinds of fish. Cast wider nets, fish in other ponds. So it sounds like great to have it and great to augment it with other ways of thinking how to get in a wide variety of candidates. Yeah, don't don't let it be the end all. And Amanda, what was the consensus on how far away is the DEI leader from the C-suite? I think we have a lot of uh, tandem group staff on this call. So <laughs> we can just <laughs> echo um, Zach's answer um, from before, unless someone else in the group would like to chime in, that was not um, part of tandem. Okay. Anybody else want to share from Amanda's group? Okay. All right. Let's pop on over. I'm going to just, some of the groups are a little bit smaller, but I'll say uh, Coakley or Melissa, anything from your group or Landon and Teresa, anything from your group that you can add to this conversation? I was not in those groups, but I will gladly chime in from another group. Excellent, Hannah, go right ahead. Um, So something that we we talked about a few different things. Um, One person in our group was from a smaller company around 100 or so people and mentioned that they're generally struggling with just like where or how to start. Like, how do you just like get this focus for your culture off the ground? Um, I wasn't going to say programs, obviously. And then also just we listed either sometimes a lack of sincerity, um, some resistance to change, and a general lack of education about how kind of like D, E, I, and B are all very different things, which obviously Marlo and Kevin talked about um, at at the beginning. All right. Excellent, Hannah. Thanks. Let's let's just tackle those. Um, let's go with the where or how to start, right? Because I think there's a few people on the call who might be just saying, I, I'm not even sure. So um, what are your thoughts on that, Kevin? Well, again, if the if the leader is not advocate, minimally advocating for it, um, 
if not pushing for it, it's, it's, you know, it's bound, it's, it's not going to be successful. Um, so it's, it's, while grassroots movements are, are great. Again, if you don't get the support from the top, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be successful. I, I know one of the things, um, that I often do too, is come in with data. You know, if you're a consumer facing company, for example, um, there's some cool data points out there. I mean, I, you know, for my company, I threw out the fact that uh, if we're trying to sell business to or products and services to the hotel motel industry, for example, 86% um, of hotels in the U.S. are owned by South Asian Indians. If we're trying to sell goods, products and services to the LGBTQ plus community, the gross annual revenue of LGBTQ owned businesses is $1.7 trillion. One of my mentors always told me that I need to go in and try to impact people in, in a few areas simultaneously, the head, the heart, and the wallet. Mm -hmm. Because he said, some people will just get it. You know, it's, it's logical to them. For some people, it's an emotional argument. And they'll, you know, if you play on their emotions, they'll get it. And others, if it impacts the wallet. So he said, always hit all three and you're bound to win the room. I, I think that is so spot on. Um, and I love that, right? So what's important to the leader that actually truly may not be important to you, but it's because it's a leader and the um, culture is important to you. It's how do you present the information? And I think that data is a really strong one for different types of people who might have some resistance. Great. Marlo, what would you say, Marlo, for um, for where, to, where or how to start? Um, well, I'm going to flip, flip. I'll tell you where maybe you may not want to start. I think oftentimes um, people will look to underrepresented groups for the answer. Um, and I encourage people to use the same ingenuity, intellectual curiosity, Google, you know, the SHRM website, which is like plentiful of tools and resources and white papers on how to get started. Right. I think, you know, obviously, you know, people who sort of play both sides of the fence, sort of being part of an underrepresented group and also leading these initiatives can get the answers, uh, you know, and suggestions faster than not. But where else would you begin if you didn't know the answer to a question? I would maybe just scratch below the surface a bit and challenge yourself and push yourself to be super resourceful, super curious, and, you know, relentless to find out what you need to know. Even if that means stepping outside of your comfort zone, you know, Google, you know, local, you know, DEI, you know, experts in my area, you know, oftentimes these organizations will give you a free, you know, pitch it, just to consider them for a relationship, right? So I just, I, I had it to preface with that because I think um, this is a really important topic. And I've actually been asked this question quite often. I'm, I'm in, I mean, if you, you know, Brian knows this directly, but if you look at my family background, I mean, we're very inclusive. We cover all spectrums. I mean, the intersectionality is real in my family base. So I'm, I'm obviously not opposed to it, but I would like to challenge folks to, you know, how else do you get the answers you need? and maybe start there and then come back and let's have a conversation on what do you think about X, Y, and Z? You know, show me some solutions that you kind of talked about and then we can get into a really exciting conversation about how do we together solve this problem rather than putting it on, you know, a particular group or a demographic to solve it. Good, 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 good. Um, okay, and I think that we had already um, shared a little bit about um, if there is a resistance, what what to do and and how to um, show up as for yourself, and then seeing what can change or changing the situation could even work too. Okay, so uh, let's do this. Yeah, can I, I just a, a quick question? What 
I'm just curious, this group, what does resistance look like? When you say there's resistance, can just anybody, like what, is, what does that mean? What does it look like? I think I've experienced in my past, when you bring up the word diversity and inclusion and affirmative action, certain people get scared and nervous that by giving something to someone else inclusion wise is taking away from themselves in a way. Mm -hmm. So battling that kind of thought that including another anything is somehow removing an opportunity for yourself is something mm -hmm. that come across. Okay. Have people said that directly or is that just kind of a pattern you're you're seeing? I've definitely heard heard it said directly. Okay, interesting. Okay. Who else wants to share what resistance looks like to you? What you've seen? Well, I think in order for it to be, Marlo said this earlier, like you have to be infusing it into your culture. It's not just like the flavor of the month type of thing. So if the culture has always been a certain way, mm -hmm. there might be that resistance to change of, well, like, oh my gosh, we have to change the culture. But that's, we didn't talk specifically about that in the breakout group, but that's just a thought. There might be some change resistance there. Thank you for that. Um, getting into the weeds, getting into the weeds just a little bit. Um, I will say I, I worked for a brilliant DEI leader, um, Pat Harris, when I was at McDonald's. And one of the things I think she was genius at was bringing in stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. DEI was not just Pat's job. She brought in government relations. She brought in marketing. She brought in HR and talent acquisition. Um, she brought in even the chef from the innovation center. And we would have regular meetings and just talk about where does diversity even tap into your areas? And we were able to do things like getting salads served on the Senate floor when, when McDonald's introduced salads. We were able to do things like women saving the company's hides uh, by introducing salads and getting us away from lettuce in a cup that McDonald's used to call salads. Um, you know, things like Mick Cafe, that was all due to stakeholders being open. And, you know, honestly, DEI departments don't have big budgets, but when Pat wanted us to have great representation, let's say at the NAACP conference, she went to the marketing department and said, hey, there's 10,000 African-American movers, shakers, and decision makers. Don't we want to be there, marketing mm -hmm. leader? <laughs> so suddenly we had money. So... I would say get your stakeholders involved and show them what's the ROI for them. She was she was a genius at that. I agree, Kevin. Pat was amazing and she was definitely a trailblazer. She worked, I don't know if you know Tyrone Studemeyer. Oh, I know. Her well. Locks, yeah, yeah. yeah that, he's my mentor. Um, so that's how I got to, to know her. But one of the things you guys may want to think about too is applying what Kevin is talking about um, in the context of your um diversity business resource groups. You know, one of the things that Pat, as well as Tyrone, sort of drove into me is these can't be, you know, fun clubs or simple affinity groups, like particularly in organizations where you're seeing that resistance and people are afraid there's no space for them or they're being weeded out. You have to be able to show them the business value of these organizations. And it's tremendous. I mean, I think McDonald's is an organization who's been stellar at it. Um, so, you know, honing in with your uh, DBRGs and getting a stakeholder at the executive level who's a different demographic than the group. So you can get that connectivity and understanding. Then that person is going to go be the voice in the room on behalf of the group and push some of the initiatives along faster. But you have to be able to, to sort of speak to how does this add to our business strategy and our bottom line if you want people and, to and listen. Marlo when when Don Thompson was our CEO mm -hmm. he challenged all of the ERGs and he he specifically told the black ERG we're introducing coffee it's better and cheaper than Starbucks why is Starbucks out indexing us in the black community right and and he issued that as a challenge to the ERG mm -hmm. 
And one of the regions, actually, long story short, we were able to give away coffee samples at a couple of the largest churches, Black mm -hmm. churches in the Detroit area, because the marketing folks said, if people taste it, they'll love it. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We started out indexing Starbucks in that region. No surprise. Due Not to the ERG. Be. Due mm -hmm. to the ingenuity exactly. of the ERG. And Don, and Don challenging them. Mm -hmm. Good. A couple of uh, comments that have been coming in through chat uh, that I wanted to share. As Jad said, I wanted to share in our group, headset wasn't working. Often I feel it's a partnership with my internal stakeholders to assist them along in their DEI journey. And me just understanding that everyone is starting at a different stage in their journey. And being able to meet people where they are is the way that I read that. Um, and then also it was uh, stated by Jad that we tie DEI initiatives to our CEO's compensation, which uh, I thought was uh, interesting to hear. And some people had some comments on that as well. Let me just make sure. Okay, perfect. Okay, good. So let's um, let's do this as we're getting near the end. Um, anybody have a last question that they would like to ask Kevin or Marlo at this stage? Totally open floor for it. Okay. So then going to the triple A with awareness, action, and accountability, what we would like to know is what is one action that you're going to do from this webinar, right? Can be anything uh, that came to mind, any ideas that you heard, something you might want to Google, um, conversation you might want to have. Why don't you go ahead and type it into chat? Because that will help you with the personal accountability to actually do it. So if you could type in one action that you are going to take from today's webinar, that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, toss this, I'll toss a softball out to the group. Good. Who are the three to five go-to people in your professional and personal life? And if they're not different than you, add one that is different from you. Love it. Great action to be able to take, correct? So let's just and see. If I'll, some of I'll add on to your softball, Kevin, because I think it's <laughs> genius. And if you go through your circle of 10 or however your circle works, if there are no people who look like me, mm. I am more than willing to become that person. This work is my passion. Um, I live for it. And again, I go back to the start, like I'm creating a world for my children that is, wasn't as difficult or won't be as difficult as it has been for me. Um, so again, if no one is in your circle who looks like me, um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can get my, my info from, from this session. I'm happy to be that person for you. That's excellent. I'm going to go ahead and share um, contact information here uh, for um, Kevin and Marlo, as well as Karen, myself and Brian, so that you just have that if you need that. But I would love to be able to read a couple that come through on chat of what is the action that you are willing to take. And this isn't the time to be quiet. This is the time to actually just say one thing that you'd be willing to do. So let's see. Take a moment. So, all right. So, uh, Kevin, why don't you leave us as people are typing their actions in? Why don't you leave us um, with your last thoughts? Then we'll move on to Marlo and then call it a wrap. So, I, you know, I was moved by Marlo because I, I too have kids. Mine are a little older um, and they're out of the house. But I think we owe it to the next generation to leave them with a better place than the current state indicates. Um, I have never seen a world so divided um, unnecessarily. And, and I think there is something to the power of one. And I think if each of us stand up, um, we can make that world a better place for my kids, Marlo's kids, yours. Um, but I think it, you know, it takes, it takes us standing up and, and not 
it takes us being upstanders and not bystanders. Excellent. Marlo? Oh, I love it. And some so actions are coming in. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just close with um, just be brave and be innovative. Um, you know, again, if you look around the room and it's a pretty homogenous group, what are you going to do to change the dynamic? You know, we are incredibly fortunate to be in this profession and we have the unique influence to really drive this initiative. So when you're in the moment, if it's not happening, just be brave and challenge yourself to do something different because obviously what's going on isn't working. Great. Karen, any last words? Um, I, I just, I just love what Marlon just said. Challenge yourself. It all starts with you. And, you know, awareness doesn't mean anything without that action. And then now Kevin with the accountability, I love adding the accountability because, um, you know, awareness is great, but put your money where your mouth is. All right. Perfect. All right. So we want to thank everybody for joining us. We know that, um, we, uh, went for almost 90 minutes and that's a big time commitment to be able to be a part of the conversation to think through what it is that you personally want to do how you can affect the cultures within your organization and truly just in life work is a, a interesting place to be able to bring it in but I also think it's in the day-to-day -day of how we live as well and um, I want to thank Tandem and Brian for allowing this conversation to happen and this is just part of the tandem talks and we um have noticed on the chats that people are getting some good takeaways and we want to thank everybody for their time so i think on that note we'll call this one a wrap and go be the change <laughs> all right, all right. Thanks. bye everybody take care bye thank you bye